this brain bit by bit, I will show images of encephalitis of the limbic system and talk a little bit in detail about the several arches that make up the limbic system. And the limbic system is not an anatomically defined network, but more of a functional concept involved in controlling of emotion and in memory. The structures that are always included in the limbic system are the cingulate gyrus, the amygdala and the hippocampus. And if you look closely to this coronal flare image, you notice that these limbic structures have higher signal intensity than the neocortex. And the signal intensity of the subinsular cortex is in between that of the hippocampus and neocortex. In 2008, I attended a very interesting lecture by a Swiss radiologist named Valavanes, who talked about the evolution of the brain and how the structures on the inside of the brain are phylogenetically older and therefore have a higher water content and higher signal on the flare images. And he named this limbic system, these limbic structures, the old brain. The limbic system consists of several arches and the middle arch is formed by the hippocampus, which is continuous with the gray matter of the inducing cuisine. The inner arch is formed by the white matter output tract of the hippocampus, the fornix, that you can see in this drawing and on this sagittal T1 weighted image in the floor of the lateral ventricle. And at the level of the anterior commissure, the fibers of the fornix diverge, ending in the mammillary bodies that you can also see on this sagittal T1 weighted image. And the outer arch of the limbic system is formed by the parahippocampal gyrus starting in the uncus of the temporal lobe, continuous with the isthmus of the cingulate, then the cingulate gyrus paralleling the corpus callosum and ending in the subcollosal area. And as previously said, there are many connections between the arches. Limbic encephalitis can be autoimmune. And in this case of a 32-year-old woman, the antibodies are targeted against the NMDA glutamate receptor. And you can see that there is pronounced flare hyperintensity in the subinsular region, in the cingulate, and in the mesial temporal lobe, more than the normal hyperintensity of the limbic structures. Limbic encephalitis can also be paraneoplastic, as in this case of a 26 year old with leukemia, with hyperintensity of the amygdala and hippocampi. And you can already notice that. On the coronal T2 images, the abnormality is very difficult to detect or not even visible. Encephalitis of the limbic system of the old brain can also be caused by an old virus, such as herpes simplex virus type 1, which is the most common cause of encephalitis in immunocompetent patients. And herpes encephalitis is bilateral, like limbic encephalitis, but usually more asymmetric. And um, as in the previous cases was also illustrated, sometimes the findings are very subtle. And then diffusion-weighted imaging can be very helpful because the inflamed cortex has restricted diffusion because of the edema. This is a case where detection is not the problem. Also herpes simplex encephalitis with extensive abnormalities, edema and swelling in the mesial temporal lobe and also the rest of the temporal lobe continuing in the cingulate and subinsular 
region. And herpes encephalitis might give some hemorrhage, which can be detected on gradient or susceptibility weighted images in contrast to limbic encephalitis. So besides the asymmetry, that's also something that might discriminate between the two. In immunocompromised patients, there's another herpes virus, another old virus that goes for the old brain, and that is human herpes virus type 6, um, which also gives encephalitis of the amygdala and hippocampi, and the subinsular region is less often involved than in patients with herpes simplex virus type 1. And as it, this, is a, this occurs in immunocompromised patients, so this might be a good differential in the paraneoplastic encephalitis of the patient with leukemia. Thanks for watching and until next time when we will continue with degeneration and atrophy of the hippocampus in Alzheimer's disease.